Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today I'm going to talk about the kinds of UFO cases I love most. And by that I mean onboard UFO encounters. In fact, today's episode is called The Experiencers. Five Cases of Onboard UFO Encounters. As I've said many times, sightings are interesting, and of course landings and face-to-face -face encounters with humanoids, but onboard encounters are the closest of all UFO encounters. There is pretty much zero chance of misperception when you are enveloped in the phenomena itself. These are so extensive. We get a lot of information from these cases. This is the true heart of the UFO phenomenon. So I love these cases, and I've only got five I want to present to you today, but they're all quite extensive. So we're going to learn a lot about ET contact, who they are, where they're from, what their agenda is on our planet. And I've got cases from across the world. There's one in South Africa, one in Brazil, one in Canada, and two in the United States. These all involve a variety of humanoids, different types, a variety of experiences, and of course, unique elements as well, and supporting evidence in terms of corroborating witnesses and medical effects and all these different types of evidence we so often see. So yeah, some really interesting cases tonight, and let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about, I call must have water. There are a number of cases in the UFO literature where ETs approach people and ask for water. And that's what happened in this case from South Africa. This occurred in spring of 1951 near Drakenstein Mountain in South Africa. It's a really interesting, extensive, and unique case with some super interesting elements to it. And I think you'll find it really fascinating. This case was investigated by researcher Juan Jose Benitez, who says, and I quote, It is one of the most spectacular of the cases that I have investigated in recent months. The story is one that would indeed be difficult to believe were it not for one very simple but overriding fact, namely the professional and cultural standing of the witness. So this is a great witness. He is known only by his initials, HM, and he was at first very reluctant to talk about his story and had to be convinced. He is an engineer originally from England, and he specializes in the development and construction of automatic pilots for airplanes. So clearly a very intelligent man. And at the time of his encounter, he was living in Parle, South Africa, near the location of the encounter, Drakenstein Mountain. Now his car had recently failed, so after giving it a full overhaul, he decided to take his vehicle for a drive to recharge the battery. And this is when his encounter occurred. It was around 11 p.m., and he was driving along the foot of the Drakenstein Mountain, and he was about to turn around and head for home when he saw a man, a normal human-looking man, standing alongside the road but waving his arms in an obvious request for assistance. So the witness, H.M., stopped his car and asked this man, What's the matter? And the man replied, have you any water? Now, according to the witness, he told this man that the only water he had was in his car radiator. Now, the man was not happy to hear this. He got a distressed look on his face and told HM, you see, we need water. So seeing this man's obvious need, the witness offered to guide the man to a nearby stream just up the road. And this strange fellow standing by the side of the road said, Is it far to this stream? Now he spoke in English, according to H.M., but had sort of a strange, unplaceable accent. 
and H.M. said no, the stream is just down the road, and that it was a mountain stream with good, cool, pure water. And this strange man seemed very pleased to hear this, so H.M. invited him into his car, and off they went, and they drove to this stream. And when they arrived there, it was clear this man had no container to hold the water, so H.M. grabbed an empty oil can that he had in his car, washed it out, cleaned it all up, and then filled it with water from the stream. And then together they got back in the car and drove back up the mountain. And this man that he picked up instructed H.M. to drive a little further up the road. And this is when the witness got an incredible shock, because there, landed on the ground not far away, was a classic flying saucer. And as H.M. says in his own words, I perceived that there was a strange object there. It was about a hundred meters or so from the road and in the zone of shadow cast by the mountain. It was quite big, between 10 and 15 meters or so. It wasn't very high. In the under part, I could see an opening which was lit up and some steps which led to the interior of the machine. I stood there dumbfounded. So at this point, he could see that this was your classic flying saucer, and to his amazement, this man he had picked up, apparently an E.T., invited him to follow him inside. H.M. was a little bit nervous and somewhat afraid, but the man seemed friendly enough and kept insisting. So H.M. agreed and followed him inside this craft. And I'll just let the witness describe what he saw, as he says in his own words, Inside the object, which was completely circular, there were other men. A total of four more, in fact. One of them was stretched out. Apparently, so my companion explained to me, they had had a slight accident, and the recumbent man had gotten burned. Then I replied that I would like to get a bit closer so as to be able to see the wounded man. But my companion said no that I must not move from the spot where I was. So I stayed there, but by the entrance. It was a circular room. There were square windows all around it, and under these windows a sort of circular couch going all the way around. In the area where the windows were, the ceiling was somewhat curved. In the center of the room there were some levers set in a small rectangular area about one meter in height. So he's looking at all of this. According to H.M., the beings, these men, were about five feet in height. They looked human, human enough, but they had higher than normal foreheads. They had brown hair. They were very slender, with slender hands. All of them were clean shaven. All of them were dressed identically in a sort of knee-length laboratory overcoat which was fastened around their waists with a beige-colored belt. And H.M. was amazed to see that although there were no apparent light fixtures, the entire craft seemed to glow with light. This is, of course, a description we hear often about the interior of these UFO craft. Now, the injured man was laid out on the couch alongside the wall, and the other figures who were attending to him paid no attention whatsoever to the witness and were simply concerned with their injured companion. But the figure who H.M. met took the can of water to the others and then returned to speak with the witness and asked him if he'd like to ask any questions. And this is where this case gets so interesting because, of course, we have here a witness who's quite well educated and interested in aircraft. And his first question was, where are the engines? Because he didn't see any. And the ET, presumed ET, replied, we don't have any engines. HM asked, then how do you navigate? The ET began pointing to these lever type instruments and said, we have a different system. We nullify gravity. That is how we rise. 
So I'll just let the main witness describe what happened next. According to him, and I quote, I asked them how they overcame gravity, and he replied that they use a very heavy fluid which circulated in a tube, and with this system they created a magnet, that is to say, somewhat as we do with electromagnetics, except that they, instead of using electricity, were using this fluid. Apparently this fluid was subjected to a velocity similar to the velocity of light, that is to say, the velocity of electricity. But I answered, that is impossible. No, he replied, it is simple. When the fluid is leaving the tube, it is already entering the other end. Thus, its relative speed is infinite. So it seems that on the base of this system, plus a few magnets of a kind which clearly do not exist on our planet, these beings had achieved enormous velocities and were able to conquer gravity. So this is interesting because there are a number of cases where the ETs have explained how they power the craft, and this is what they're attempting to do with this witness. And then the gentleman, H.M., asked where they came from. And the E.T. pointed to the stars and said, quote, from there. And I'll just let H.M. describe what happened next, because this is quite interesting. As H.M. says in his own words, I insisted on wanting to know from which cardinal point in the sky they came. But he simply kept repeating, from there. And then he rapidly changed the subject. It was obvious that he didn't want to say any more about that. So after we had chatted about 15 or 20 minutes, he pointed in a friendly but firm manner towards the door and invited me to leave. And I did. I went down out of the machine and departed. So he drove off while the craft was actually still there. But this really affected him profoundly. He could hardly believe this had happened to him. And very curious about it, he returned to this exact spot the very next day. As H.M. again says in his own words, Thinking it had all been a strange dream, I went back to the spot, and there were some very strange marks there. And on top of that, there was the matter of my can, which we had to carry the water in, and which was now missing. So he had some evidence, at least, that this experience was real and not just a dream. But it should come as no surprise that he didn't want to talk about this for quite some time and had to be convinced to tell the story. Because it really is quite phantasmagorical, especially all the way back in 1951 when, when it occurred. But H.M., the witness, is absolutely convinced it was a real experience. As he says in his own words, I remember it all, still, with absolute perfection and in all its details. I think that case has some really important takeaways. Again, it's one of many cases where ETs ask for water. And as we found out in this case, it's apparently connected to a healing event. Another thing I like about this case is the witnesses not seeking any publicity or attention whatsoever, insisted upon anonymity. I think that speaks towards the credibility of the case. It's got some interesting physical evidence as well. And it's very interesting that he asked the ETs where they're from, how the craft operates, and they provided at least some limited information about this. So it's a lot to like about that case. It's super interesting. And here's another case that I think is equally, if not even more, fascinating. And I call this one Taken in Itaperuna. Itaperuna is a city in Brazil. And in fact, this case occurred on September 25, 1971 in Itaperuna, Brazil. It's a super fascinating case of extensive contact where a gentleman was basically followed by a UFO and then taken on board. And his testimony, while does rest, this case rests solely on his testimony, there are supporting witnesses as well. And later, during further contacts, he does have more supporting witnesses. 
some very interesting things happened. The ETs gave him some important warnings, something we often hear about in cases like this. It's just a really remarkable case that I think deserves to be more well known. The main witness in this case is Paulo Caetano da Silva, though in some accounts his last name is Silvera. At any rate, he's a typewriter technician and salesman. And on the evening of September 25, 1971, was driving through the city of Itaperuna to his home when he saw a glowing red disc following his car. It came quite close. It was about 10 feet behind him, he says, and only about 2 feet off the ground. It then circled around his car and caused the engine to fail. But suddenly it took off. So Paulo was sweating, quite frightened. He started the car engine and drove to the nearest police station and reported the encounter. Unfortunately, they did not take him very seriously, other than telling him to stop driving that night. And if he's so scared, why doesn't he just spend the night in the city and resume driving in the morning? But Paulo wanted to get home and after calming down for a few minutes, he decided to continue his drive. So he's driving along and was near the village of Sereria when this UFO returned. It zoomed ahead of him, and this time it landed on the road, right in the middle, blocking his way forward. At this point, it's around 8 p.m., and he said this craft was quite small, about the size of a VW Beetle, a little car, and it was a classic saucer shape. And as he's watching it, it emitted a beam of light, which caused his car to pull off onto the shoulder, stall, and the doors immediately popped open. At this point, Paulo found himself unable to move. And as he says in his own words, first I saw only a ball of fire moving toward my car. Then, when it sat down ahead on the road, the transmission disengaged and the car began to obey the commands of the little men who were descending from the ship carrying a lantern with an obfuscating light. So as he watched, three beings approached the car. They were very short, he said only a few feet tall, about the size of a seven or eight year old child. And he said they didn't quite walk normally, they appeared to glide or float up to the car and used beams of light to pull him out. And he was quickly taken inside the craft. Inside the craft there were six beings. He said they wore blue jumpsuits and a smooth covering on their head and weird helmets, kind of Roman type pointed helmets. He says their shoes were squarish. The only visible part of their bodies were their hands and faces, which he said were light gray in color. They had dark slanted eyes. He said it was weird because they walked stiffly without apparently bending their arms or legs. And he was unable to resist and just walked dutifully into this craft. And once inside the craft, he said it appeared to go whooshing upwards. He heard a loud whining noise, which he described as a, quote, infernal din. He said the ETs moved around quite quickly and appeared to be communicating to each other in a way that he could not fully understand. The room itself was large, larger than it appeared on the outside, and very white and bright, so bright that he had trouble seeing. He did see what looked like buttons or some sort of control panel, but he was most impressed by the way these little guys were rushing around. One, he said, was gliding back and forth between these two lighted objects on an overhead walkway. Paulo himself says he was placed in a beam of light, and he believed that at this time he was being physically examined. Another very strange thing he noticed is that his body felt much lighter than normal while inside the craft, as if it had a lighter gravity. Again, he did have the impression this craft was flying around, but at some point he lost consciousness. To his awareness, the encounter lasted about five minutes. But the next thing he knew, 
He was being carried out of the craft which had landed. The ETs carried him and lay him on the road next to his car, and he watched as this craft rose slowly, vertically, and then shot off horizontally at very high speed. Now at this point, poor Paulo was extremely disoriented, in shock. He had a lot of trouble seeing. He said he was practically blind at this point because the lights inside the craft were so darn bright. Uh, he was taken to a hospital where he was examined by Dr. Munir Busab, and he was found to be healthy and sent home. But he had some pretty significant physiological effects. In the week following this encounter, he says his vision suffered pretty badly. It took a long time for his eyes to heal. They were watery and quite red. Also, he was very anxious and nervous. He suffered a loss of appetite. He did notice later that his wristwatch was about 15 minutes slow, which would speak towards the actual accurate length of this encounter. And later he did find a strange mark on his arm. Now, Paulo did report this incident to the police. And in support of his case are several other encounters which occurred that night in the same area. Most notably and significant, I think, is what happened to another truck driver, Benedito Miranda, who said that he was being chased by a bright light and, in fact, was crossing the Carangola River Bridge right outside of Ita Peruna when his car was blocked by this little craft, which he described in the same way that Paulo did. Very small, the size of a small sports car, saucer-shaped. He said he saw three small beings in blue suits wearing those same strange Roman-type helmets that Paolo described. He said at one point he was struck by a beam of light, found himself being pulled out of his car by this beam of light, and raised, get this, almost 150 feet in the air. He was very frightened, but was unable to move or call out for help. But thankfully for him, when suddenly a car approached, this beam of light immediately set him back down. So, it's very interesting that he gave the same exact description of this craft and these beings. And thankfully, he did report this experience to the police. So this was incredible confirmation of Paulo's encounter. And researchers, of course, found out about this case and did a thorough investigation and found numerous other people in the area who also saw what is apparently the same craft in this area on that night. But this was not the end of it. Paulo had a number of encounters following this. It was less than one month later, on October 11, that Paulo woke up around 3 a.m., and saw apparently the same craft land in his backyard. Out came these same little beings. They looked directly at him, pointed a weird box that they were holding in their hands, pointed it at his head. He said at this point he experienced a brief headache. The next thing he knows, the beings are going back into their craft, which took off. A brief encounter, surely, but it wasn't the last one. The craft returned again on November 5. And this time, Paulo's friend, Herbert Diaz, saw the craft. And ten days later, another encounter. And amazingly, this time, Paulo was able to take about six photos, three of which clearly show a lighted object in the sky. Then, another encounter on November 17. This time, he was driving again with his another friend, Elvio. And Paulo told Elvio a UFO was following them. But Elvio said, no, it's just a bus. And then, weirdly, Elvio suddenly fell asleep, and Paolo found himself being taken on board again, placed on a table. He said a blood sample, he believes, was taken. And then they showed him something very interesting. The ETs showed him the city of Ita Peruna in Brazil, and then an explosion of an atomic bomb. I'm guessing this is the kind of warning we often hear from ETs. 
Either way, it wasn't his last encounter. On December 5, he was driving again near the Karangola Bridge. When this UFO showed up, he was taken on board, and the ET spoke to him, and they had a message for him. They said that their mission was peaceful, and that what they were doing was preparing people for contact. Paulo's last major encounter occurred on December 19. He was driving to his friend Herbert's house when he saw the craft in the distance. So he stopped his car to observe, got out, walked towards it. Suddenly this craft darted right over his head, sent down a beam of light, and lifted him about two feet off the ground and then set him down. Very strange. But again, in confirmation and corroboration of this case, later other people in the same area saw apparently the same craft on that night. So after that, he did have a few more sightings and took more photos. But it's certainly a fascinating and very complex case of a UFO ET encounter and onboard UFO experience. I really like that case for a number of different reasons. All those supporting witnesses, the fact that the main witness had multiple encounters and was even able to photograph these craft. That's super unusual. Not a lot of contactees get that opportunity. And he had repeated experiences over a period of months. It was quite an intense period of time for him. And uh, I'm so glad that he did get some corroborating witnesses because I know, having talked to a lot of contactees, that they often feel quite alone with their experiences. It's just a fascinating case. And this next case is also super interesting. I think the vast majority of cases go unreported, uninvestigated, and this one very nearly slipped under the radar. I call this one the Oihi River Encounter. This occurred in September of 1975, of course, along the Oihi River in eastern Oregon. It is a multiple witness case. It does have some super interesting physiological effects and, of course, psychic effects, how it affected the witnesses afterwards. A lot of really interesting details and elements to this case that I think make it worth being more widely known than it is. I doubt any of you have heard of this one. This case comes from researcher Terry A. Hartman, and it involves a couple who we know only as Daryl and Tony. They, at the time of their encounter, were residents of Portland, Oregon. And they very much enjoyed taking camping trips in the Oregon wilderness. In the summer of 1975, they took a three-day camping trip to explore an archaeological site, go water skiing, and enjoy the wilderness in the Owehi River area of eastern Oregon. And they enjoyed their camping trip. It all went very well, but they were driving home and had pulled off their pickup truck by a small creek to cool off. It was quite warm and also give their pickup truck a rest. Their pickup truck, and this is important, had a tendency, a tendency to overheat and needed to have a rest because when it got overheated, it wouldn't function well and it was very difficult to start the engine. So they pulled over. Daryl had just took, taken off his shirt to cool off. And looking up, he saw what he thought was a plane. And he described it as looking very much like a B-52 bomber. Strangely, however, it wasn't making any sound. Now his partner, Tony, saw it too. But she described it differently. She said to her, it looked like a supersonic jet. But again, making no sound. No sooner did they see this when there was a weird shift and the next thing they knew, they were looking at a shiny silver object landed in the valley next to them. Now, neither of them spoke about it or really thought much about it at all, but just kind of walked away, got into their pickup truck. And to their amazement, the pickup truck started right up. Again, normally it was difficult to start when the engine was hot, but then they looked at the temperature gauge 
and they saw that it registered as the engine being cold. This really puzzled them because they thought only a few minutes had passed. But apparently they were wrong, though they weren't quite connecting to it at that time. They drove home without incident, but when they arrived, they discovered another mystery. They were about two hours later than they thought, so they clearly had missing time. But by this time, some of these details were already being forgotten, the plane and the shiny object in the ground, so they really had no clue how to explain the missing time. Now, over the next few months and actually years, there were a few other strange things. Tony, who had always been psychic, experienced a very strong increase in her abilities. Daryl became unaccountably very depressed. In fact, he became depressed to the point that he was not able to hold his job as a mechanic. So this was quite difficult for them, a difficult period of time. And they started putting the pieces together, especially when they heard UFO researcher Terry A. Hartman on a talk show. So they began to wonder, you know, about this missing time and had they been taken on board a UFO. So they ended up contacting Terry Hartman and arranged for a hypnosis session. Now under hypnosis, and it took a few sessions, both remembered seeing this quote plane and then the silver object on the hill. Both recalled falling into what felt like a trance and they began to walk towards this landed craft. Daryl went first, with Tony following about 10 feet behind him. Daryl remembered walking up to the craft and actually touching it. He said it was weird. It kind of reminded him of Teflon. He walked around it. He saw what looked like an octagonal opening with rounded corners. And of course, Tony verifies this. This is exactly what she saw. Next thing he knows, a ladder seemed to materialize, and he found himself crawling up it. He recalled turning around and seeing Tony staring up at him in kind of a daze. Again, Tony remembered all of this. But the next thing both of them know, they're inside the craft. The next thing Tony knew, she was inside this small room, which was quite dark, but had walls with what looked like little lights on them. She's trying to orient herself when this opening appears. She walked through and saw her husband lying on his back, strapped to a table by his legs and arms. She said the room was white with curved walls. Along one side were a few small chairs, a small table. She saw a strange looking instrument hanging down from the ceiling over her husband. On one wall, she did see a round porthole or window, and looking through it, she first saw only blackness and then clouds, and then, to her absolute amazement, she saw the planet Earth as viewed from space. So these are some very interesting details, which are not super uncommon. Often people do report these kinds of things. So she's watching all of this, her husband, uh, his eyes are closed. He's apparently not seeing any of this. But as she's watching, another opening appears and in walk two humanoids. She said they had dark gray, kind of wrinkled skin, small facial features, no visible ears, no hair that she could see. They wore dark gray uniforms. And they approached Tony and began making this audible buzzing sound. She could hear it. But at the same time, she heard a telepathic message. And it was very interesting what they told her. They said they meant no harm, that they had not meant for her to follow Daryl into the craft, but told her that because she was so psychic, they believed that she would be able to handle the experience and view what they were doing. So they then turned their attention to her husband, Daryl. And she watched as two ETs began to thoroughly examine him with that strange in instrument that was coming out of the ceiling. She watched as this instrument emitted sort of a pin beam of light which scanned his body. 
she saw one of the ETs grab Daryl's arm and pull it from above and below the elbow, as if trying to stretch out the elbow joint. And at this point, Daryl screamed out in pain. Now, Daryl actually recalled all of this. Uh, he couldn't see the ETs. He never opened his eyes when he was on board the craft. Not because he didn't want to. He just says he couldn't. But he could feel all this. And he says when the ET pulled his arm, it was very painful. But that the ET immediately took the pain away. He could feel them touching him. Again, never saw them. But Daryl then had a very interesting detail to all of this. When he went under hypnosis he, and experienced all this, he then told the hypnotist that as a young man, he had badly injured his right elbow. And after that injury, was never able to fully extend it ever since. At this point, the encounter ended. The next thing Daryl and Tony knew, they were getting back in their car. But both of them do feel that this was a benevolent encounter. Tony says that the encounter resulted, again, in a very strong increase in her psychic abilities, but she also became much more grateful about life in general. Daryl, amazingly, says that his elbow injury was completely healed, and he no longer suffered from depression, and he found out the source of his depression. He says that the ETs were not only very friendly, but he says they were so full of love that it upset them to see all the troubles humanity is experiencing on Earth. And this was the cause of Daryl's depression. He felt such love for the ETs and was so upset about all the madness going on on the planet that he couldn't do anything about. So a very interesting case. And in fact, while they were both going under hypnosis, again, this was several sessions, Tony woke up one evening and saw one of these ETs standing at the foot of her bed. And he told her that his name was Ahab. Very strange, but quite a remarkable multiple witness onboard UFO encounter. And I think you'll agree that's a truly fascinating case. Really hard to deny when you have a multiple witness case. And it's super interesting how profoundly it affected the witnesses psychically, emotionally, mentally, and physically. I mean, the fact that this gentleman was actually healed, I think, speaks towards the ET benevolence. Yes, he was somewhat traumatized. Yes, he did experience pain, but they took it away immediately. They were trying to heal them. I wonder why. <laughs> it's super interesting that they pick people to heal. Uh, perhaps he was doing some important work for humanity. That is a pattern I see with a lot of contactees. Hard to say for sure, but certainly an important and interesting case. And here's another one that I doubt anyone knows about because it's received very little publicity. I call this one Taken on Crystal Mountain. This one occurred on July 14, 1985, near a ski resort, at a ski resort, in Crystal Mountain, Washington. It's a super fascinating case involving a gentleman who had missing time while hiking on Crystal Mountain and sought out hypnosis and uncovered a really remarkable onboard UFO encounter. This is a single witness case, and the witness is known only as Joseph. He wants to remain anonymous. And it was a warm Sunday afternoon around 2.30 p.m., again on July 14, 1985, when Joseph, who was a businessman around age 59, and his partner Cassandra, decided to venture to the Crystal Mountain Ski Resort and take the chairlifts to the top so they could take some photographs of the mountain. But when they got there, Cassandra hurt her ankle, and it turned out that the lower Miner's Basin chairlift wasn't running. So Joseph decided that he was going to hike up alone to the upper Iceberg Ridge lift and then take photographs from the Summit House. So he left Cassandra at the lodge and began his hike. And he had no sooner left when suddenly the next thing he remembers is waking up 
and he's now lying face down on Powder Pass, which is about 2,000 feet above the point where he had begun, begun his hike. And in fact, he was now about a quarter mile east of the Summit House, so quite a distance from where he had just been. And as Joseph says in his own words, I was panting like a steam engine. I was petrified. I had no recollection of how I'd gotten there. I was emotionally drained. I don't know how I got there, but I was up there on those rocks. So Joseph says he couldn't have hiked there. There was no way. He was very lightly dressed. He was, he says, in poor physical condition. Looking at his street shoes, which weren't for hiking, they weren't scuffed at all. He was very disoriented, somewhat sore, and he stumbled back down to the lodge, met up with his partner, Cassandra. Uh, he said he got there around 4.30 p.m. So he was missing about two hours. And she could immediately tell that something very strange had happened to Joseph. And in the fact, in the days that followed, Joseph was still somewhat traumatized. Upon getting home, they found what looked like five, quote, needle marks on his back, but they very quickly healed and faded away. But as Cassandra says in her own words, he would jump at every little noise, like the telephone ringing. He's never shed more tears. He didn't leave the apartment for a couple of days. He didn't want to be alone. And as Joseph says in his own words, it was the first time in my life that I didn't have control over an event. So yeah, this was quite difficult for them, the aftermath. But after doing some research on cases involving missing time, Joseph wondered if this was connected to a UFO encounter and decided to seek out hypnotherapy. He contacted researcher and hypnotherapist Fred Rance, who's a very experienced and well-regarded hypnotist, and Fred placed Joseph under hypnosis. The sessions were successful in recovering the memory of the lost time, and no surprise, Joseph remembered being taken on board a large craft. And as Joseph says, it, the craft, was about 200 to 300 feet in diameter and was blue, the undersurface was, it had no lights on it. Her Joseph, this craft hovered nearly above him at a very low altitude, and the next thing he knew, he was on board. And again, as Joseph says in his own words, I don't remember how I got into the ship. I understand they can levitate you, but anyhow, the next thing I remember, the only thing I remember, was I was in a white hospital bed and there were around 25 or 30 figures around me. And they were diffused. You couldn't see their features. But they were humanoid. It wasn't like E.T. They were blurry. They were grayish-green humanoids. So his memory of the whole event is pretty sketchy. He does believe he was being examined. And in fact, while under hypnosis, he learned how he was taken on board. He says that he was taken into the larger craft via a smaller craft, a little two-seater type vehicle with a glass dome on top. He says it carried him up into the larger craft through an opening in the center of the underside. And once inside the larger craft, he saw a window along the wall to the outside, said it was very much like being inside of an airliner. Like many witnesses, he said this room was curved. He recalls being placed on a weird chair and then on his back on a table. He said the beings, who he never really got a good look at, surrounded him and were looking down at him. He did see one of them pouring liquid out of a beaker-type instrument. And at some point, he said he was flipped over onto his stomach and examined and after being examined, he was then placed back into the smaller, sort of car-sized craft, which exited the larger craft, and he was then placed on the ground where he woke up. So a pretty short and standard onboard encounter, but certainly very interesting in that he saw about 30 different beings. 
but that is not super common. But after being hypnotized, it was a short time later, he saw what he believes is the same craft again. This time, hovering above the Seattle Trust building, not too far from his apartment. And it was just a few days later, on the evening of August 21st, he looked outside of his window and boom, there was that craft again zooming across the horizon. So a very interesting case, which was also researched by UFO investigator Dale Goody, who said that Joseph's account was, quote, very convincing. And no surprise that Joseph himself believes that he was in fact taken on board the UFO. As he says, and I quote, there's no doubt that this happened. I think you'll agree that's a super interesting case. Uh, and like we see in many of these onboard experiences, there were follow-up UFO encounters. It's just not a singular event in most of these cases. And clearly this did affect the witness very profoundly. I think that's pretty much standard when people have these really close encounters. I can only imagine what it's like for these people to be taken on board. And I'm sure it's far more common, again, than most people realize. Certainly more than the general public has any idea. There are just so many cases. And here's another one which is perhaps, for me, the most interesting of this little collection in this episode. I call this one Taken in the Yukon. It's a super interesting case, which occurred on September 3rd, 1987, of course, in Yukon, Canada, along a very remote highway in the wilderness, involving a gentleman who was on his motorcycle when he saw a UFO and then saw ETs, praying mantis type, which is quite unusual. And as we shall see, he had a really remarkable onboard encounter, which he didn't remember at first. He did actually have missing time, but immediately afterwards, the onboard segment came back to him spontaneously without the use of hypnosis. And I think you'll find it super interesting because it's got some elements to it that are quite rare perhaps not unique, but not often described. This very interesting case was investigated by researcher Martin Jacek and involves a young man by the name of Kevin. So he wants to remain anonymous, but Martin interviewed the witness thoroughly and calls him a quote, very honest, sincere, and reserved individual, not at all the type looking for attention. So Kevin's encounter began early in the morning of September 3rd, 1987, when he got on his motorcycle and was going to join some friends to go hunting. And he was driving toward McPass in the Yukon along this remote highway. And at some point during his trip, he pulled over to relieve himself. It's still early morning. And that was when he saw a strange craft very low in the sky. He thought at first it might be a plane, but it made no noise. There was no wings or tail, and it became immediately apparent to him that this was not a plane. And as Kevin says in his own words, it had what looked like a porthole all along the side of it. It was cigar shaped with a gray strip down the middle and a dark green on top and bottom. As I watched, it seemed to partially dematerialize and then return to solid form. It did this as it was moving a couple of times. And then it dawned on me, oh, I don't think I should be seeing this. It's a UFO and probably doesn't want to be seen. I crouched down on the road, hiding behind the roadside grass. I then watched it go behind a cone-shaped hill and not come out. I stood up looking for it and feeling very excited and happy about what I saw and thinking they didn't even know they were being watched. Now Kevin did notice one other strange detail. As he says, when I was watching the UFO move slowly in front of me, I thought I better get a picture of this. My camera was just inside my jacket in my shirt pocket 
and was very quick and easy to get at. Then a sort of calming feeling came over me, and I felt like, it's no big deal, don't worry about it, I don't have to have a picture. Afterwards I thought, what bizarre behavior. I kept two cameras on the go all the time, and I was always on the lookout for photo opportunities. To think a UFO photo is not important is insane. So I found that detail very interesting. It's certainly one I've heard many times. And it's pretty funny that Kevin didn't think that the ETs or the people inside this craft knew that he, he was watching them. Because after what happened next, it became clear that sure they did. <laughs> they knew they were being observed. And we're about, in fact, to take this gentleman, Kevin, on board. But Kevin, at this point, thought his encounter was over. Then he heard this weird metallic clunking sound behind him. He first thought it was a car door and that someone else had approached. And he was excited because he wanted to share his story and see if these people saw it too. But turning around or walking towards this, the source of this sound, he saw not another person, but in fact, two ETs. And I'll just let Kevin describe them in his own words, because he gives a very detailed description of what happened next. As Kevin says, and I quote, I came face to face, about 20 yards, with two gray creatures in blue jumpsuits, about five feet tall, with big insect-looking heads, pointy faces, big eyes, thin arms, bodies, and legs. I immediately thought, they're not little green men, they're grasshopper people. Before this, all I knew about aliens was that they were supposed to be little green men. At that same instant, the one on the left raised his left hand to his wrist, which held some type of flashlight device, and I saw a bright flash of light come from it. I instantly felt paralyzed and was convinced time had stopped. Everything was black, no sound. I tried to yell, no, but all that came out was a distorted grunt. When the being shot me with this flashlight device, I experienced what they call the cone of silence. It seemed like time stood still and nothing existed but me, like I was pulled from reality. It was the most absolute quiet ever imagined. I was really scared and tried to yell no, but all that came out was a gnarly growl. Everything went dark, and I had the sensation of hurtling skyward at terrific speed. I also felt that I was being stretched as if my feet were on the ground and my upper body was 20 feet above. My whole body was shooting skyward. The next thing I knew, I was standing on the side of the road, scared, shaking, and confused. Within seconds, I remembered all of this that had just taken place, and I thought, I'm getting out of here before they get me again. I turned around to get my bike, and for some reason, it was not there. Then I noticed it was on the other side of the road. I said to myself, what the hell is this? I didn't put it there. Still panicking? I rushed over and got on it and realized the keys were gone. This was weird because he didn't move the keys. And this is when he realized that the keys to his motorbike were in fact in his hand. He jumped on his motorbike and immediately drove off. And this is when he noticed something very strange. It was no longer morning. And in fact, before a half hour had passed, darkness fell. So he was very confused by this. This is quite a long period of missing time. And he told himself, and again I quote, I'm not telling anybody about this. I'll just forget the whole thing. So he drove straight to his trailer, put on a pot of coffee, and as he's doing this, suddenly he heard a soft humming noise coming from outside. And he was pretty sure this was the same UFO he purposefully did not look outside, did not look out the window. He just sat down and drank his coffee. And this is when he started to get very vivid flashbacks and memories of what happened to him 
during this missing time. And in fact, he had a very clear memory of looking down and seeing the landscape below him flashing by at a very high rate of speed. He then remembered waking up and finding himself looking into the eyes of a gray alien. Not sort of the praying mantis that he saw on the ground, but your typical gray E.T. And I will just quote Kevin here at length, because boy, he describes a very interesting onboard encounter. As Kevin says in his own words, I could hear in my mind a voice saying, there is nothing to worry about. I could hear him talking in my mind. There were three or four of these types walking around, but only one talked to me. The two I saw earlier on the road, I never saw again. I then sat up and had an idea of what might be going on, and I asked, Are you going to do experiments on me? And the one said, They've already been done. I felt really good then because, except for a strange sensation in my hands, everything felt normal. I kept rubbing my hands together, but did not look at them, as there was a totally strange environment to look at instead. I experienced no discomfort. The being nearest me asked me if I would like to see my home planet, and I said, sure. I then walked over to the window where there was a machine that looked like a big copy machine. He asked me not to touch it. I replied, don't worry, I'm not touching anything in here. He then said, that bright white star is your home. I didn't know anything about astronomy at that time, but I always thought Earth was blue, so right away I thought he's lying. He also explained to me about space and stars, etc., but I can't remember any of it now. I was also asked if I would like to go on a trip. I replied, not yet. I felt very honored to be asked, and I did want to go, but felt that the time was not right. Then I was told I would have to forget all of this. I was disappointed at hearing this. The first part of the experience was very scary, but once I was with them, I found them to be friendly, helpful, and their looks didn't bother me. They actually seemed like old friends. They gave me a clear glass, three-fourths full, with a yellow liquid, and said to drink it up. It would make me forget everything. I told them I did not want to forget an experience like this. It should be remembered. I was told it was for my own good that I forget. So I took three little sips and put the glass down. Next thing I know, I'm on the road by my bike, scared to death and wanting to get out of there. So that's his encounter in a nutshell. When he got home, when Kevin got home, he did notice a strange sensation in his hands and looked down and saw a small scoop mark on each palm. They persisted and he later asked several medical professionals about them, two doctors and four nurses, and none of them could explain it. They said they'd never seen anything quite like it, couldn't attribute it to any condition, but as Kevin says, I still have them. Kevin did feel the desire to share his story, but at the same time he was reluctant, not so much because of fear of ridicule, but because, as he says, Every time I tell someone, I feel like I just broke a promise I made to them that I wouldn't tell anybody. This feeling, feeling may just be me, or it may be programmed into me to keep quiet. I don't know. I decided to tell it as more of an awareness thing. I'm sure other people have had experiences, but are held back. So there you go, another fascinating case involving multiple different types of ETs. A gentleman being given a liquid to consume, that's not very common. Very interesting how they showed him the earth from a far, far distance away. I have heard that many times. It's just a fascinating case all around. So, those are the five cases I wanted to present today. Again, it shows this is a worldwide phenomena, one that's ongoing, cases from the 50s to the 1980s, and of course they reach back further than that, and continue on forward through time. This is just a 
tiny little glimpse into the huge number of cases of people who have been taken on board a craft. I've come to know for certain that the vast majority of people do not report this kind of experience, particularly because it's so extensive, and they are afraid of ridicule and disbelief, and will even keep it secret from their own family and friends. Thankfully, this attitude is changing, the subject is moving into the moon's mainstream, and it's being taken a lot more seriously. It's about time. It's way past time. I think it's a very important subject. We have a lot to learn from these ETs. I don't think we have anything to fear from them. Honestly, in my opinion, it's the own people, our own people here on Earth, the folks behind the government <laughs> cover-up, who are the ones we should be concerned about. That's just my personal opinion, but I think I've got some good reasons for it. At any rate, I really want to thank you for watching. I hope you found it interesting and maybe even learned something. And I want to thank you very much for watching. It's truly appreciated. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep searching for the truth, and most important of all, keep having fun. Until next time, bye now.